Hello everyone. Wow, what a buzz in the room. I think I everyone enjoyed the keynote then. So my name is Rob Curley and I'm really excited to talk to you today about service missions. So before we get into it, a little bit about myself. So I'm a consultant at Redify and previous to that I was a technical lead for APIs at Hikewest. So I've spent a large amount of my career around architecting backend distributed systems as well. So this is a special area of interest for me. So before we get started though, I'm keen to understand who's heard of the service mesh package before. Cool, a few hands. Who's using one in production? <laughs> That's cool, That's to be expected. So really the purpose for this session today is we're actually going to explore the motivation behind the service mesh pattern. Why is it a common thing? What problem does it solve? Particularly, what category of problems will it solve for you? And then we're going to take a look at how it contrasts with previous approaches. And we're going to take a leisurely stroll through how our thinking has evolved over the years. So we'll look at API gateways, we'll look at our good old friend, the Enterprise Service Boss. So we'll see how there's there's a lot of parallels and similarities between them, but there's some you know, critical differences as well. So after we've gained an understanding then of what it is, how it can help us, we'll then look at some of the advanced capabilities. So how does it actually make our lives easier? And finally, based on the show of hands, really my main aim today is to start a conversation about service mesh. Realistically, we have 45 minutes together. Not everyone will leave the room being an expert with service special distributed systems, but if I can encourage you just enough when you leave here today to learn a little bit more about it, that would be a wonderful outcome for me. So every great presentation has a story. And our story is a love story. <laughs> it's about when service A met service B. <laughs> and they're deployed on the same host, so they can talk every day. It's really quick, it's friendly, it's beautiful, love is blossoming. And this is back in the 50s, these are baby boomer services, you know, these are, you know, it's a wonderful world. But then, as part of a digital transformation, service B gets rehosted. That's okay. Distributed system is easy to run. It's gonna be hard to make this work. Oh, not so much. It's very hard. So, service A, now instead of just being able to call over to service B and say, hello, has to send a letter. Same time, there's no feedback for that. What happens if you send too many letters that service B could consume? You say, needy, all of the stuff, there's no feedback loops. Panic! <laughs> you just resonated with anyone in the room? <laughs> and the fact there's a huge amount of concerns that when you're talking in process, it's just simple, but now we have to deal with all of these things of the unreliability of the network. And in fact, Peter Dutch and a bunch of his compatriots at Sun Microsystems catalogued what they call the eight fallacies of distributed computing. And these are things that called out to warn us against some of the false assumptions that we make. So some of the key ones is the network is not reliable. Latency is not zero. Your letter does not instantly arrive. Bandwidth is not unlimited. Again, even the postal service could only handle so many letters. So, Again, what are some of these big issues that we dealt with again? So we mentioned this, flow control. Service A can send as much data as it, you know, it can see fit to service B, but what again, if it overloads it, does that data get lost? Can you then bring down service B from just throwing too much data at it? And this was typically when we started back in the 50s, you know, with these distributed systems. Again, the application tier itself had to, you know, put all of this logic in to add that reliability itself. It didn't get a lot of help. In fact, the help that we just take you know, as a given today. And flow control is just one thing. But it highlights a point is maybe this distributed computing thing is just a little bit harder than what we originally thought. And in fact, if we were finished with flow control, that would be one thing. But there are so many different concerns. There's reliability, observability, and traffic management. And for each of them, we can dig into it. So what's involved in traffic management? So again, it's load balancing. So again, so you don't have dependency on a single node. 
But at the same time, there's many algorithms you use round robin. You get bonus points if you can do latency of where load balancing. So again, you know, there's various levels of maturity here. Service discovery, how do I actually know where to send my traffic? And often, DNS alone will not be sufficient. There's access control. And again, there's per request routing. So if we really have this advanced distributed system, being able to individually control each request is an incredibly powerful capability, as you'll see as we move forward. Observability. So we're interested in insights into our system running in production. So success rates, latency logs. So in fact, in distributed systems, latency, a, you know, a leg that's returning slowly, is actually more difficult to deal with than a leg that's simply down. It adds a hell of a lot more complexity to it. So we're going to be looking at request volumes, and again, distributed tracing. So if you've worked with Zipkin, which is implementation of open tracing. So again, trying to build a picture of all the requests as they flow through the system. And then again, for reliability. We have to have health checks, pretty typical. Circuit breakers, again, how do we build reliability into calling a leg that might have been down or intermittently down? Retry policies. If I call a service and it fails, it is safe to call it again. Because we're all building our deposit services, aren't we? And again, timeouts, the classic kind of concern in distributed systems, but again, tuning those timeouts. So have them conservative enough that you're not risking resources being consumed at the same time, not making sure that you're prematurely causing failures across your system. So again, when we consider all of these things, it's actually a lot harder than it initially seemed. But where there's a will, there's a way. So how do we then actually start to scale out some of these capabilities? And in fact, over time, that flow control, for instance, it moved from the application tier down into the networking tier. So again, it no longer was a concern to the application developers. They could just make a call on a lot of that in order and delivery, retries all of that was handled at the TCP layer. And this was an incredible boon for us. So again, instead of dealing with sending physical bits across the wire, or then at layer two, we have links, and then data frames, and then finally at the IP layer, we have addressing. And then TCP, that gave us all of that power, so we could just send the request across. And a huge amount of that complexity of doing it reliably was handled by the network team. It's abstracted away from us. And again, that pattern repeats itself time and time again. So as we now build more complicated systems, we apply that same logic. So whereby we have to handle certain concerns like service discovery in the application tier, you'll see that we want to push them down into you know, an underlying layer, or possibly a centralized location. And that's what we did with the Enterprise Service Bus. So again, one of the ideas from there is again, we had these multitude of services. Some of them talk to MQP. Some of them talk so. Some of them probably, you know, some proprietary scheme. But they wanted interoperability between them. So again, with the enterprise service bus, we added this central piece of communication infrastructure, which then had adapters, such that you could then take maybe this one form of XML and transform it into another message as well. Is that familiar? Anyone running an ESP in production? You can admit it, it's okay, it's a <laughs> These were actually incredibly popular because they solved a real problem to begin with, namely how do you get disparate systems to communicate? And again, we can build workflows as well. Typically, this is an orchestration-based flow. And sure enough, I actually worked on one of these with a team up in, in London. When we introduced one, yeah, but the first hundred integrations were amazingly quick. But then after that, things started going slow. This started to become incredibly complicated. When we changed one integration, we started to break another. And then it was like, okay, well, let's see how we can scale the team. And of course, Fred Brooks and the command month, you can't keep throwing people at a problem. But operationally, they also have a bigger issue. Typically, a centralized architecture will result in a single point of failure. So again, with any distributed adaptive system, they're one of the key things that we're looking to avoid. And again, when you're putting or consolidating all this logic in one place, it becomes complex. It's harder for one person to understand the mental model of the system. And then that's when attribute changes. 
confidence is a huge thing when you're looking to release. So if you can't understand the entire system, or people get nervous with there's risk, that's when the speed at which you start to deploy slows down. And then Cloud Native came along. And this really looks to challenge a lot of pervading thinking to that point. And there's four main pillars of Cloud Native. So DevOps, how do you build a culture around continuous learning? How do you build what about sharing? How do you support that culture through automation, like that empirical decisions based on metrics and data? Putting that into practice with continuous delivery to actually create those feedback loops. Microservices to provide the same level of agility in your architecture as you have in your delivery process. And finally, containers as the packaging format. So moving away from heavyweight VMs to lighter containers and lighter weight components such that, again, you have more flexibility in the host and you move them around. So what does it look like, though? So remember in the original sort of diagram we had service A and service B. So what we've now seen in the microservices world is that has exploded. There are connections going everywhere. So that's better, right? <laughs> but you'll see that there's a big move again. So instead of that centralized ESB layer, we've actually then put all of the smarts back into the services themselves. So what's a service? A service is business logic and data. With an ESB, we often had all of the logic in the ESB itself going to thin data entry endpoints. This flips it on the head and say, we want to keep the network done but we want to have all of that business logic next to the data in the individual services themselves. And this is sort of being paraphrased in like the Gorilla SOA movement as smart endpoints and dumb pipes. So let's see how we can apply that to, again, a microservices world. So again, we're saying service discovery. You know, I can buy imports and DNS. I need something a bit richer. Circuit breakers, again, to make sure that if I'm calling downstream services, which you know, might not be reliable, how do I then wrap that function then, and then aggregate failures over time and if it fails a certain portion of the time, I can then say, that's cool, I'm not going to call it anymore, I'm going to give that downstream service a chance to recover. But what we're seeing, in the same way that back for a little baby boomer services, they had to worry about flow control, all of our services are now having to worry about all of these complex concerns again. And you're like, bro, well, well, I thought one of the major benefits of microservices was, again, being able to choose your language of choice for the particular problem. But having to have these libraries to do all of these, you know, complicated concerns, <coughs> there's a friction there, there's a tension. So typically how we, how we address that then was shift these concerns out to a sidecar proxy. So we get a proxy that will handle ingress and egress from that particular service, which we can then include the circuit breakers and service discovery and retry policies and all that at that particular sidecar. So there's examples such as Prada from Netflix that came out. One of the beautiful things from here is that's just HTTP between it. So you can have a legacy service that hasn't been written with any of these concerns in place and then encapsulate that in your new shiny, your language of choice. So again, provided provided like a lot of benefits then. So we, didn't, we, we no longer have to say, well, I could only write this in Java because we use the Netflix open you know, service stack, and ergo, everything has to be written in that one language. So again, from a deployment perspective, we have now all of the communication in and out of our individual microservices happening through these sidecar proxies. And from, if anyone's read Enterprise Integration Patterns, that is an example of the ambassador pattern if you want to find out a little bit more about the concerns there. And this is one of the underpinning concepts of the service mesh. So, William Morgan from Boyd was actually the person who coined the phrase service mesh. And this is how he described it. So first of all, he says it's a dedicated infrastructure layer. So similar how we saw with the networking layer where we had encapsulated flow control to a TCP at that level. So he then sees the service mesh as being that same infrastructure level concern. I not handle that layer seven within the application itself. This focuses on reliable delivery. 
That reliable delivery is typically implemented through an array of lightweight network proxies. And a key point there is the application should not need to be aware of this. We shouldn't have to change our existing code to support this. And that's a key point. So, Service Mesh isn't aimed to allow us to do anything new that we couldn't do before. But it allows us to do pretty complicated use cases a lot more easily, but also allows us to shift the functionality out of our application themselves and into this dedicated layer. And the service mesh is comprised of two parts, a data plane and a control plane. So the data plane we have already seen. So a data plane in the service mesh is anything that's in the flow of the traffic between two services. So particularly, the sidecar proxy. But there's also a control plane. And that is how we actually get decentralized management of your services. So again, the control plane sits outside of each of the individual microservices, but it beautifully allows us to push policy to each of these servers. So what we can do is we can configure in the control plane and then have have that push the policy out into each one of these individual services. So you want to change how authentication happens. You define it here, and then you can roll it out to each one of those proxies, and you have consistency across the board. You want to change your timeouts, again you can do it centrally. And in fact a lot of the control that we have with the control plate is the exact same as we had with that centralized DSP, with a key difference. So with the ESP, both the control plane and the data plane were in one unit. The control plane was on the critical path. As you see here, if the control plane goes down, that's fine. The service ca carries on just as it was before. We just can't update the policy, but that's fine, right? We still have reliable delivery between all of these services. And if you're running on a platform like Kubernetes, again, you'll have your deployments configured to auto-scale. So that's beautiful. So we've now decoupled our concerns of application traffic routing from our infrastructure scaling as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. So we're going to put sidecars on everything, right? That's clearly the takeaway from this talk. No. Your application still needs to have a certain level of maturity to warrant investment in this. So again, if you have a monolithic app, and we would end up with one sidecar, like, don't bother. There is a lot of complexity inherent with this, so as with any new piece of technology, make sure that you have the problems that it actually aims to solve. And I'll talk a little bit more about that too. So we've talked conceptually about what a service mesh is. So we're now going to look particularly at Istio, which actually had a major milestone. So this is a service mesh from Google and a number of other companies. And it just hit release one earlier this week. So yeah, perfect timing for this conference. And if I was wondering why I have a little bit of a cryptic boat there, Istio is actually the Greek for sale. So there's a bit of thought that's got it there. And Istio then comprises a number of components. So first of all, down at the data layer, the data plane. So it uses Envoy. So it's a HTTP proxy from Lyft as the sidecar proxy, and it supports HTTP 1 to 1 traffic, HTTP 2 traffic, GOPC traffic, or any other format over TCP itself. And mutual TLS is, is optional. If you want all the traffic encrypted between the services, absolutely. It's just a config setting. And again, we have the control plane, but this time the control plane is actually comprised of three components. So first of all, we have pilot. So this handles the pushing out of traffic policies. So, you know, what can talk, what can talk to what? Again, any of the other concerns about routing between the various services. <coughs> we then have a mixer. And this is where the policy checks are enforced and also we gather telemetry. So again, we have each of these sidecars then sending rich data back to be either gathered in 
in Heapster or for use in any visualization through Grafana. So again, we have this telemetry gathering. And finally, Citadel. So again, if you've chosen to do mutual TLS, Citadel is what will actually provide those TLS certs and that authority in that process as well. There's also another component which has come out recently called Galley, which is intended to validate the user-defined configuration and effectively provide an abstraction between Istio and the underlying platforms. So Istio can run on a number of platforms, so Nomad, Kubernetes, a number of more. And that's actually what Galley provides, that abstraction between the commands that we enter in and how they actually get applied to the underlying infrastructure. And what does it let us do? Now, this is the bit that's really, that's really important for me. Tech is cool, but how does it allow us to do things that we couldn't do before? And in fact, rather unfairly, I think testing and production has had a bit of a bad rep over the years. But I would say every single person in this room is doing it. You might have just realize it. The trick with it is to do it safely. So with these complex adaptive systems, it is not actually very beneficial to prove that in one particular scenario, running in your own data center at a particular point in time when people are having dinner and not a lot of traffic going through here, like it's incredibly specific. It is impossible to have full confidence that this system, which can fail in a myriad of ways of production, will actually be reliable. Systems are very rarely up or down on these type of systems. You will inevitably have partial failures. But it's how you, you identify them, and then how you recover from them is key. So I guess probably when you say to test and production, it could be a bit of an emotive statement, but what we're really saying is we test our code pre-release, and then we test it again in production. And this testing and production sort of like view one has evolved massively over the last couple of years. And this, on the left, we, we typically have all the things we did before. But now we have a lot of other techniques. So again, as you deploy, what are certain things that we can do? So integration testing, load testing. And then also this really interesting one, shadowing, which for me is one of like, it's always been this really advanced technique that I would say, that would just be amazing. I wish if I could do that, but never had the infrastructure in place to actually enable it. So traffic shadowing or traffic mirroring. So what this allows us to do is if you have version one of a service and then you deploy version two, what if before you actually send any real production traffic to service two, because you might not be 100% confident it will work, if you could mirror or shadow a sample of the traffic from service A and duplicate it through to service B, completely off the critical path, but then you can actually see how that service will respond in real time to representative production traffic. <clears throat> Let's see how that would work. So again, service B, maybe a little bit of a risky release, we're not 100% confident with it. You can never be 100% confident about anything. And then we have Envoy handling the egress from this service and the ingress into service B. What we can then do is shadow all the traffic, duplicate the traffic, and in fact, Envoy then will add a shadowed prefix to the host or authority header, such that service B can then identify that this is shadowed traffic. So if it's going to cause a state mutation on the back end, this is fine, it's synthetic traffic. But what we've now done, all the user will still be going through this flow, but we are now, as a release team, having a huge amount of insight into when we actually flick that switch, how it will behave. This is pre-release, this is deploy. What about then when we start to actually want to put production traffic to it? And there's been a capability also sort of thinking around for quite some time about canary releases. And uh, the origin of this is when there was, you know, back in the mining days when there might have been poisonous gases down in the mines that would take a little canary down and, you know, well, that, you may leave the canary would before the person. But it's the same sort of theory from here that we want to be able to have quick insight or feedback into how a service will perform before we're sending all the traffic to it. And again, this is, we can configure this incredibly easily. So again, what we can do is through our control plane, we can then update the traffic routing policy to that particular service. And in this case, we're saying, 
Let's start with 95% going to service B and uh, service B V1 and 5% to V2. Over time, we can then increase that load. I actually don't think it's going to be too far fetched in all of the near future to have a have a policy that says start at one percent and just gradually automatically increase it over time. If you're not seeing failures, that's fine. We'll be done the pump. This is really the level of automation that this can provide us. Trying to do this manually would be an absolute nightmare. This brings a whole host of capabilities that were beyond us before very attainable. So as I mentioned before, what we've now completely done is decouple infrastructure scaling. So if I have my Kubernetes service there looking at V1 and V2 deployments, and then I said that's absolutely fine. In theory, traffic can go to both V1 and V2 simultaneously, but I can now lay another traffic management policy over the top of it. And I don't have to change my deployments to be able to update and adapt to that. So when you're running a service mesh, typically I see that being supported by a platform team. It is still sufficiently complicated to get right that you have a dedicated team to ensure the smooth running of that particular service. And as I mentioned before, an app should be able to be wrapped with a sidecar proxy without the application needing to change or be you know, aware of it. The pop quiz. Do application service developers then need to be aware if there's a mesh in place at all? Who thinks they do? Ooh, there's gonna be a lot of people who think they don't. Who thinks they don't then? Okay, okay, we have some people on the bench. <coughs> I'd argue you should. So Jay Krebs, which is one of the original, who was one of the original architects behind um, Kafka, and he had a great term for when microservices first came out back in 2014. And if anybody else kind of been writing Java about 10 years ago, you might have come across distributed objects. And they had this wonderful idea that you could have an object which could actually result in a remote call, but the developer doesn't need to know about it at all. Great idea until you actually start using it, where suddenly the performance of the system is terrible because you're having all of these remote calls happen, but you had no idea, no feedback loop around it. So I think definitely, while they should be aware that the proxy is there and how it actually then aggregates telemetry and where that makes it available, absolutely the policies then, again, can absolutely be part of the application tier, but actually then the supportive infrastructure, how do you actually scale out that service and make it reliable? I see that as being a specialized skill set, at least initially within your organization to make sure that it, it syncs. So question then, so we've covered a little bit about service mesh tracking itself, and then a particular implementation with Istio. How would we go about introducing one into your architecture? And again, our friend William Morgan has some insights for us. And it's typically around the hype around service meshes now. And he actually says that any one thing brings down Service mesh, it will be unrealistic expectations put around the problems that it will solve. If you have a microservices architecture, or you are finding the operating cost or cost of ownership of your services is high, or you're not having the ability to release quickly and take advantage of a number of capabilities such as canary releases, such as <coughs> mirroring, absolutely can provide a lot of value then. Start with a single capability. Don't try to roll everything into the mesh. Again, instrumentation is generally a good one to start with. Instrumentation is really table states for any distributed system, or in fact, any product's team full stop, and what provides the feedback to enable data-driven decisions. So again, remember with DevOps, and again, having a culture of continuous learning. Continuous learning and improvement is only possible when you could base it on empirical evidence, moving from gut feel to data-driven decisions. Instrumentation, great spot to start with that. And it's typically off the critical path as well. If the quality of the instrumentation might be there, initially, that's fine. You can improve that over time. So what have we covered? A service mesh, dedicated infrastructure there, 
to make intra-service communication reliable. If you are facing problems around the operability of your microservices fleet, a service mesh can help. And most importantly, service meshes afford gradual adoption. Take advantage of it. Start with a single use case, prove that it works, engage your stakeholders, show and demonstrate the value from it. So I've been talking for about 35 minutes now. That leaves us about 10 minutes for questions. Who's first? Reese. Um, you talk about reliable communication, but some of the things we're talking about were uh, synchronous. We were talking about, was this on? No, oh, sorry. Yep. Check one, two. Um, you're talking about reliable communication, but we were also talking about um, requests. Request response synchronous comms like HTTP. How do sidecars and circuit breakers happen in that regard? In, um, in a messaging architecture? So, a lot of what I discussed today is about optimizing RPC, which is very much one part of a far wider discussion around distributed systems. So, with sidecars, there's a couple of initial projects that are coming out now to say, well, how do we actually adopt this same level of thinking to a message broker type architecture whereby you could have each one of like maybe the broker wrapped around egress and again each one of those consumers. But there's nothing in production that I'm aware of or you know in the community that's actively being developed around this sort of sidecar service mesh approach for those async message flows. So really service meshes today are about optimizing the RPC flow. But at the same time, just because you have one part of your system that works in a request response, I will ask a question, I will wait for the answer, does not mean in any way that the entire system needs to be. Absolutely, I could still have, for instance, a front-end calling that additional service. They could absolutely raise just a number of topics. And then that could result in a whole number of offers being generated, which could then be persisted in the database. So that maybe after those 500 milliseconds, that service just reads the generated offers, for instance. So def definitely when we look at these systems, it's about mixing and matching to say whether I send a command, whether I send, you know, whether, whether I'm going to act on an event, or again, if it's going to be a sort of like request response type pattern as well. So you could definitely consider this as another very valuable tool to have in your toolbox, but not necessarily, you know, the one way you need to do things moving forward. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's going. Cheers. So I've seen, I mean, I think you've got really good points about you need some experts to run this stuff because it is a lot of work to maintain it in a steel deployment. I'm wondering if you've had any experience of the interaction between traffic shaping and the, the auto scaling in, in Kubernetes deployments. Is, is this traffic shaping happening on the service level or is it happening on the pod level? How does that work? Yeah, really good question. So the, the traffic shaping will happen at the pod level, so at layer 7 within the application itself, but then based on the policies that will be sent down from the service mesh itself. And in fact, you actually have a couple of different deployment options that could be there as well. You can actually run the sidecars. Let's see if I can actually find that for you. So this is how you might actually deploy Linkerd on, on a mesh. So instead of having all of the sidecars actually within the pods themselves, you can actually run it as a daemon as a daemon set. And the reason why we do that is the JVM has got like a pretty heavy footprint. So again, to prevent you know having like a couple of hundred mates running in each one of the particular pods, which would then consume a lot of resources, we then put that out to be once per host. Um, but again, still controlling ingress and egress across each of the pods. I'm just uh just a question on scale. Uh, are there any learnings you could take from uh, service mesh design that you could move to, say, smaller scale projects where you don't have a dedicated team of people to support it, and you, you know, you've, you've basically got 
just a handful of devs that are, that are trying their hardest to do what they can. Yeah, really good question. So as with any piece of technology, you need to understand whether the investment that you're going to put in this and the cost of ownership of running it, you know, either a, you know, a Kubernetes infrastructure there, or again, something like the service mesh over the top will have a return on the investment for your particular issues. So again, if you look at where service mesh really came from, it came from having you know, operability concerns about having fleets of hundreds of thousands of services. And again, trying to you know, coordinate a lot of the you know, reliable release from them as well. One thing that I can do is when I am, um, I'll send out, a, I'll, I'll tweet later about a couple of really good uh, blog posts from the team at Monzo, which are a Leo bank in the UK. They heavily use Linkerd, which is a service mesh for Buoyant. They have a huge amount of content, both about their application of the service mesh, but then also how they scale it out over time. And actually with the decisions that they made about whether they would introduce a mesh early on in their architecture, or then see you know, when they reach a certain point of maturity. And in fact, this is something, and again, a brilliant post on like a post-mortem on a production incident where they actually had service discovery, service discovery and Linkerd was actually one of the major issues from there and how you respond to it. But Linkerd was the first of these, so the team of Buoyant actually are in the process of writing a replacement for Linkerd called Conway, <coughs> or as of version 0.5, they've actually renamed it to be Linkerd 2. And based on that, they actually then look to really strip down the amount of configuration that a team can make up front because Linkerd doesn't let you do everything like barrier to entry. Teams to get a phone. What are all the things I could configure? So what they really up to there was a streamline that onboarding process. But to come back to your original point, it, it really this is to aim at solving operability issues in you know at scale. So if you're seeing that you're having many releases that might be failing, or issues happening in production that you wish that you could have just had you know, a reduced mean time to recovery. And in fact, John Osborne has some really good points. So he's the ex-CTO of NC Online Marketplace, and he actually thinks that mean time to recovery, which is reportedly one of the key metrics for DevOps, is actually a little bit misplaced. So I guess one of the key points from there is what what's the mean time to identification, and then through to recovery. So again, the telemetry that you can get relatively out of the box with the service mesh could really help you pinpoint where the issue is happening. Because again, with the monolith, it's happening in the monolith. And you're having a lot of tools like New Relic or After Navis, which could then highlight which particular code from there. What we're looking at a microservices architecture is where and across this entire fleet of services is the problem. And only then when you found what the problem is, can you actually fix it. So look at, look at your behavior and see where you're spending your time. And then based on that, you can see, okay, well, what would some of the effort be going to do and then carry the value proposition. But I'll send you on those links. I'll, I'll tweet them out later over on but it's really good reading. I think we have time for one yeah. more question. Yeah. Yeah, this one's just uh, specific around the canary uh, releases. And it'd be useful, like, AD experimentation. Like, um, there's one of the things I'm looking at is the AI modeling, so we might have say three or four different say application uh, um, response modeling and for, for clients coming in. And so it'd be great if we could then pass on the traffic to maybe four different services. Yeah. Yeah, coming through, yeah, and then change the four services. Yeah, so what you can actually do, so I, I actually showed just like a really a really basic sort of like traffic policy. Yeah. So 95%, 5%. But what you could say is 5% of mobile traffic, or just for YouTube's, <coughs> or anyone else, so you can actually have an incredible amount of, you know, fidelity around those traffic routing rules, so it doesn't have to be just a raw 5% of traffic, but you could absolutely say for this particular call, at this particular time, matching this particular pattern, then route that as well. Yeah, well, I have yeah, yeah, exactly. mobile services. yeah, so it doesn't have to be just a very vanilla policy like this. You could get a lot more creative, but actually make it targeted. Absolutely. No, that's actually a really good point. Next time I do this talk, I'll actually put the slider out there. So yeah, please appreciate that.
I think that is it for me. Um,